Wasometrics and welcome to Wasometrics. My name is Looney and today we're assisting you with your exam prep for business studies. All you need to do to get your questions and comments through to us is check us out on our social media platforms, search for Wasometrics as well as our WhatsApp line. All of the details are on the screen. We do have a fun competition going on for you guys, so please stay tuned to get all of those details later on in the show. I've got Nicolleen, our favorite sign language interpreter, as well as Dave, our awesome teacher with me. So thank you so much, guys, and over to you. Hi, Matrix. Welcome to your preparation for, for paper one, in particular the, the business environment. So we'll be, we'll be discussing all the recent legislation uh, that will impact on the business strategies, as well as uh, the different sectors. So we're going to get into some questions first. All right, so name the three types of diversification strategies that you get there. Um, you, you're going to have to know your different types of, of strategies in terms of are they intensive, uh, integration, uh, diversification, or, or defensive. So in this, uh, in this question, they're asking us for our diversification strategies. So let's see what the answer is. So the first one is concentric diversification, horizontal diversification, and then we finally have conglomerate diversification. So just make sure you've got an understanding of the, of the three um, the different strategies that you can get and also make sure, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, make sure you understand all the different um, types of strategies that a business can, can have. All right, so we're going to go on to an essay question now. So this is your, your section C question. However, while we're also going to be doing this, this essay question now, because every essay will have four sub-questions in it, and each one of those sub-questions could be a potential section B question. So we're going to go through the four different questions of this uh, particular essay, and uh, I'll be um, explaining them to you as if there could also potentially be a section B question. So let's see what, uh, what the question has in store for us. So businesses realize the importance of strategic management process when devising suitable business strategies. So we can see, right, okay, we've got, uh, we've got a potential question on strategies here. Some businesses maintain their Porter's Five Forces model, right, so now we're looking at, at different uh, industrial um, tools that we can use, of which Porter's Five Forces is one of them, plays an important role in remaining competitive in the market environment. So remember the market environment um, is that environment just outside of the business. Business has no con uh, control over it. However, we can um, influence a degree of control over it. So let's see what the, the question is going to ask from us. So the first question is, describe the strategic management process. Um, the next question will be discuss three types of defensive strategies that a business may use to address challenges in the macro environment. Um, and the next uh, question is explain how businesses could apply Porter's five forces to analyze the market environment. So you can see the questions are already mentioning the macro environment, market environment, so it's going to be, uh, we have to make sure we get our head around the different business environments. And then the final question is advise the business on the steps they should consider when evaluating strategies. So we, I've also given you potential marks that, um, that this question could be in, in section B, as well as how much these particular sections will, will count uh, if this was just a plain section C essay. So if we go, the first question is, describe the strategic management process. So we've got two options that, uh, that are both right that you can use for this question. So I'm going to go through option one, and then I'll be going through option two. All right, so if we look at option one, um, the first part is have a clear vision, mission statement, and measurable and realistic objectives in place. Here. So before you start any business, you have to see, right, what, where do we want to see ourselves? How are we going to get there? What are our goals? So if you look uh, uh, for, for you matriculants, you should have a clear vision of what you want to achieve in your final exams now. Uh, if you don't have a clear vision, you're never going to achieve what you should fully achieve because you don't know where you should be going. 
Second one is identify any opportunities, weaknesses, strengths or threats by conducting environmental scanning or situation analysis. So you'll see there that uh, has got to do with, um, with, with SWOT. So we've got to use our environmental scan to see, right, what is happening? What is, what is good about our business? What is weak about our business? What opportunities are there out there for us? And what threats are there? Now remember our strengths and weaknesses are, are elements that we can control in, in the business. So we can turn a weakness into a strength if we really want to. A strength of ours could potentially become a weakness if we don't pay enough attention to it. So that, that's internal to the business where opportunities and threats are external to the business. Right. We have to see what tools are available for environmental scanning and these may include a SWOT analysis as I've mentioned already Porter's Fire Forces model. There is also pestle analysis, which has a look at, uh, at, the, at the macro environment. And then we have uh, in other industrial analysis tools. And then we must formulate alternative strategies to respond to business challenges. So a great example would be how have businesses responded to the COVID pandemic? Right? Um, have like, uh, if we look, a lot of businesses started to um, uh, let their employees work off-site. They had a lot of Zoom meetings, right, rather than face-to-face than -face meetings because that was a challenge from the macro environment because the government had implemented a lockdown for, for the country. Um, option, still on option one, we can develop uh, action plans including the tasks to be done or deadlines to be met and what resources um, need to be procured. Uh, we need to organize the business resources and, uh, and motivate uh, our staff. Remember, if we don't motivate our staff for, for uh, a, a strategy, uh, uh, they're not gonna wanna buy into it. If they don't buy into it, then, uh, then the strategy, unfortunately, is going to fail. Um, and then we have to implement the selected strategies by communicating it to all stakeholders. So um, if we look at, at, the, at uh, the government's um, uh, lockdown strategy, uh, we had uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa who came out and he communicated to the whole government uh, and to the country um, as to what was happening in terms of the lockdown. So when it comes to a strategy and we're going to implement it, we need to make sure that all stakeholders are aware. Otherwise, we're going to have miscommunication that can also lead to mistrust, which is going to hamper our strategy going forward. Um, and then we need to continuously evaluate monitor and measure strategies in order to take corrective action. So think of it when, if you, if you did poorly in, uh, in your term one test, right, you know now, okay, right, I'm, I'm slacking in this section. I need to make sure that I work harder to ensure that I can get uh, the, the best marks possible for, for, my, for my exam. Right, now if we look at option two, right, okay, we have to review the vision uh, um, statement, right, analyze or re-examine the mission statement, and then conduct environmental analysis using models such as, as PESTEL, Porter's Fire Forces, or SWAT. Um, we must also formulate uh, our strategy, such as is it going to be a, a, a defensive uh, retrenchment strategy? What is our, our strategy going to be? What, what are we looking to achieve from, uh, from the strategy? Are we looking to to grow our business or we're going into a bit of a defensive mode where we have to cut down on things to ensure the survival of our business going forward. So you have to determine, right, where are we sitting um, in, the, in the business environment? Um, are we looking to expand or are we looking to, to contract? Um, we must implement the strategy um, and we can use a, a template such as the action plan We've got to control, evaluate, and monitor the implemented strategy um, to identify any gaps or deviations in implementation. So to make sure that, right, what, what are the possible um, pitfalls of the strategy? Right, what can we do to ensure that we don't fall into any holes um, and make sure that we've thought of all the possible scenarios that, that could impact on our business strategy? And then we need to take corrective action to ensure that our goals and objectives are, are met. All right, so if you think of a, of a football team, 
Um, the strikers aren't, aren't getting the goals up front. So what would the coach do? He'd take corrective action. He might take off some of those strikers and put on other strikers so that they can go out there and, uh, and score some goals. It's the same thing with the business. If something's not working, you have to take that corrective action to make sure that uh, you can achieve your, your goals. All right. Now, if we look at uh, the, the second part of the question, it asks you to discuss three types of defensive strategies that businesses may use to address challenges in the macro environment. So remember the macro environment, you've got absolutely no control over that. However, the macro environment does have a massive impact on our business. So now we, they're asking us to discuss the three defensive strategies that we could potentially follow. If we look, the first uh, strategy is divestiture or disinvestment. All right, so that's where we're disposing or selling some assets or divisions that are no longer profitable or productive for, um, for the business. Um, so um, uh, a business might take um, a certain brand of theirs that isn't performing well and they decide to just dispose of it because it is now going to, it's costing them more money than it's actually bringing in. Right. Maybe the selling off of divisions or product lines with slow growth uh, potential Right, so businesses need a lot of growth um, where those particular lines, there isn't a lot of growth there. So what do they do? They, they might uh, sell it off there um, to use that money uh, elsewhere. Right, um, decreasing, you could potentially uh, decrease the number of, of shareholders um, by, by um, selling uh, ownership. And then... Uh, with the divestiture, we could be paying off our debts by selling unproductive assets, right, to, to ensure that we aren't in a, in a massive debt trap. So we sell off a, a whole bunch of, of, our, of our assets to, to help um, pay off our debt. Uh, remember that when you're in debt, you're going to be paying interest on that, and that's money that is going out of the company that the company can't take advantage of. And... Uh, they could withdraw their investment shares in, a, in another business so they can take their money out of, out of another business and, uh, and use that for, for their, their current business to ensure its survival um, um, and that it doesn't uh, close down. All right, now, the next uh, um, defensive strategy we have is liquidation. Now, liquidation is the last strategy that a business can follow. Once a business is uh, liquidated, it can no longer exist. All right. So, and you'll see why now. So, liquidating is selling all assets to pay creditors, people that we owe money to, due to a lack of capital. So, we we take all of our assets and uh, and we sell all of our assets so that we can take that money that we get from selling our assets to pay off all of our creditors, all the people that we owe money to. Um, it's selling the entire business in order to pay shareholders a fair price uh, for, for their shares. Right, so it's a, it's a last resort for, for a company. So when a company gets liquidated, they'll, they first will pay off all their creditors, and if there's any money left, they'll then pay out um, their, respective, uh, their respective shareholders. Uh, it's also on liquidation, it's allowing creditors to apply for forced liquidation in order to have their claims settled. So if you owe um, uh, your creditors a lot of money, they can force liquidation and they can um, make you shut down where you have to sell all of your assets so that they can get the money that is uh, owed to them. So you'll see there was a lot of, um, during the, the lockdown, there were a lot of companies that had to liquidate because they had too much debt and their, their creditors were, were in, in, uh, in need of money, so they had to shut down their business, sell all of their assets so that they could pay their creditors off. So their creditors forced them into that situation. So that's also why, as a business, um, as, uh, as a strategy, we want to ensure that our debt levels are well within control, that we don't have to be liquidated. And then it's allowing creditors to apply for the forced liquidation. Um, as I said there, so that you can go and um, they, can, they, can, uh, they, can get, they can get their money 
from, uh, from, uh, from you so that they can settle their debts. All right, and then the final uh, defensive strategy is retrenchment. So that's where we're terminating the employment contracts of employees for operational reasons. So there isn't enough business coming in, so unfortunately we're going to have to retrench people. Um, there isn't enough work coming in. There isn't enough money coming in. So in order for the business to save money, they will, uh, retrench, uh, they will retrench people. It's not a very nice thing to go through for, for either the company or the, or the relevant uh, employee. So it, it's something that you, apart from liquidation, it's, a, it's like a, a final resort uh, that you want to go through. Um, we can decrease the number of product lines or closing certain departments, and it may result in some workers becoming redundant. So they might say, right, uh, this product line is not performing well at all, so we, we're just going to close it down completely, and that may cause people that, um, that work in, in those product lines to then become unemployed because they've been retrenched. There's no point in, uh, in having them uh, work there anymore. And uh, that's uh, the, the first two parts of the Section C after the break. We'll be going over the, the next two uh, questions. Over to you, Lenny. Thank you, Dave. Guys, we are going to take a quick break, so please don't go anywhere. We'll see you straight after this. We're back from the break, Matrix. I hope you're still enjoying the show. If you've just joined us, we are doing your exam prep to help with the upcoming exams. If you're constantly running out of data, then this next competition is just for you. Wazometrics is bringing you the hashtag Wazowina competition, where two lucky matriculants stand a chance to win two gigs of data. All you need to do to enter is head on over to our Facebook page and all of the details will be there. Thank you so much, Dave, and over to you. Uh, welcome back, Matrix. So we're going to be going, uh, carrying on with the, this, uh, this essay question that ha can be broken down and potentially be section B questions. So the first, uh, well, we're going, we've done the first two parts of the question. Now we'll be going on to the third part of our question. So the question asks, explain how businesses could apply Porter's five forces model to analyze their market environments. Okay, so market environment, the environment just outside of the business, Porter's five forces has to do with the main elements of the market environment. So we're going to go through them now and how you should answer them. This, um, in this essay, this is for a maximum of 16 marks, but you could look in, uh, in, your, um, in your section B questions. It could range from anywhere from 8 to potentially 12 marks um, that, that you can answer there. All right, so let's see what they have to say. So first thing we're going to talk about is the bargaining power of uh, suppliers or the power of our suppliers. So how much power do our suppliers have over us? Remember, the, the rarer the, rare, the, the supplier, uh, the more power that they're going to have over us. So the first thing is, suppliers that deliver high quality products may have power over the business. All right, so if they're high quality products, they got, that means those products are going to be in demand. Right? They're the best. If your company wants to be associated with the best, you're going to have to use that supplier. Then that supplier has that, that power over the business. Um, assesses the power of the supplier in influencing prices. So if we look, the, the more rare the supplier is, the more power they have to, rise the, uh, to raise the, the prices um, for, for the business. Um, if you look at, uh, at ESCOM, they're able to increase their prices a lot higher than other businesses because they are the only electricity supplier in, uh, in South Africa. So they have that ability to, to raise the prices when they want to. Um, the more powerful the supplier, the less control the business has over them. All right, so as I used um, ESCOM as an example, right, they pretty much the only electricity supplier in South Africa, so therefore they've got a lot of power over us. Right? If, you, if you look at uh, when they implement uh, load shedding, right, there's nothing businesses can do. They have that power over us. It's not like um, businesses can go and find another electricity supplier. They're the only supplier 
in the country at the moment, so therefore they have a lot more power over the business. The smaller the number of suppliers, the more powerful they may be as the choice of suppliers may be limited. Uh, so that once again comes in more red, the, uh, the supplier is the more powerful uh, they are going to be. And if there's a smaller number of, of suppliers, uh, they, they're going to have a lot more power over us. So if you look at, uh, in terms of cell phone contracts, there's, there's a, a very limited amount of, of cell phone networks in South Africa, and therefore they can charge the prices that they do because there isn't that much competition, right? We can't just go and find a hundred other cell phone networks to be the suppliers for our telecommunication network. There's only a couple, so therefore they have a lot more power over us. Um, and we have to identify the kind of power suppliers have in terms of the quality of products or service, reliability, or ability to make prompt deliveries. All right, so can, uh, can they deliver on time? All right, if, they, if they're going to deliver on time for us all the time, right, they're going to have a lot of power uh, over us because we know that when we ask them to deliver goods for us, they are going to deliver those goods for us right there and then. Um, we can assess how easy it is for, um, uh, sorry, the, the bargaining power of, of buyers, assesses how easy it is for buyers or customers to drive prices down. All right, so if you go to, uh, if you go to the shops and, and you say to them, right, I want this, this cold drink for, for 10 rand, and usually retails for 15 rand. The shops are going to tell you, no, well, sorry, Paul, like you, you either pay the full amount or, or, or else you can't buy the product. Now, when you think of it like our big retail stores, they have millions of customers that go in there every single day. So if one of them, if one customer out of those millions goes in there to ask for a cheaper price, they're not going to give them that, that lower price because that buyer does not have a lot of power. However, if we had to take one of the retailers, one of the, our massive retailers where you, where you buy um, your groceries from, and they had to go to this cold drink manufacturer and say, right, we are going to buy 10 million units of cold drink from you. However, we want the price to be dropped by 15%. Right? Now they've got a lot more power over that supplier because they are a massive client. They're buying 10 million units where you and I, we are only buying one unit of cold drink at a time. So they've got a lot more power than we would as individual customers. Um, you have to determine the number of buyers and the importance of each buyer to the business and the cost of switching uh, to, to other products. So if I want to um, cancel my, my um, cell phone contract, I'm going to unfortunately um, incur penalties there. So it isn't worth my while for me to chop and change um, between contracts every single month because every time I enter a new contract and I leave it, I'm going to have to pay some penalties. So it's going to cost me quite a bit of money. Uh, where if it's very easy for you to switch from one uh, supplier to another as, as the buyer, right, you're going to have a lot more power there because you can chop and change without there being any financial impact on you and um, that makes it a lot easier for you to switch there. And because of that, um, the buyers can have a lot more power. Right, a few powerful buyers are often able to dictate their terms to the business. So if I use the retailers as an example, there's essentially only a handful of, of retailers in South Africa. They've got a lot more power um, because they are buying in bulk. They're buying millions of units at a time. Even though there's a, only a small group of them, they have a lot of power because if your product isn't in one of those retailers, you are losing out on a massive uh, part of the market that you could be selling your, your products to. Buyers buying in bulk can bargain for prices in their favor. Right? Um, you know, the, the more you're buying, the cheaper you can get those products and you can negotiate uh, the price down, which is going to, uh, which is going to be uh, a powerful um, position for, for the buyers if you're buying in bulk. So if we had to go to one of the retailers and say, right, we want to buy five million units of cold drink from you, right, then we'll be able to get a lot more, uh, a lot better price than if we were just like, I only want to buy one unit from you. 
Um, and if we look, if buyers can do without the business's products, then they have more power to determine the prices and terms of sale. Uh, so we, uh, you, you would have seen that um, uh, uh, during uh, the certain stages of lockdown that there, were, there was a lot of sales that, uh, that was happening because a lot of consumers had gone without those products during uh, the lockdown and now they've got that power where they can be like, well, I'm not going to buy from you. I would rather go buy from someone who's cheaper and who's going to give me a better price. So consumers had a lot more, have a lot more uh, power. If you look at um, the rental market, right, uh, renters now actually have a lot more power because um, people are, are buying houses more. However, that leaves a lot of empty homes that need to be rented. So therefore, we're going to see the rental prices go down. So now there's a lot more power for the actual buyer. All right, then we're going to look at uh, the threats or barriers of new entrants to the market. Uh, that's, that's quite big there. Right? How easily can, can, you join this, uh, can you join this market? So we look, if the barriers to entry of the market are low, then it is easy for new businesses to enter the market or industry. All right, so if we look, if you want to start your own cell phone network, there's a lot of um, red tape that you have to go through. You have to um, uh, make sure that you apply to, uh, to certain institutions. You've got to um, make sure that uh, you, you aren't falling foul of, of the law. Right? So it's, it's very difficult. On top of that, to put up all like, the, the, um, the cell phone masts, it's going to cost you a lot of, a lot of money. So it's very, very difficult to enter to the, uh, the, the cell phone uh, industry. However, if we look how much more difficult is it if you want to start your own little coffee shop or a, or a mobile coffee shop, right? there it's going to be a lot easier. So people will, uh, would be able to enter the coffee market a lot easier than they would be able to start their own cell phone network. If the business is highly profitable, it will attract potential competitors that want to benefit from high profits. So um, if we, we've seen like um, technology companies, there's been a lot of um, companies that have started um, uh, making, uh, manufacturing cell phones because they saw how profitable it was for, for one organization. If you just think of all the streaming services that, uh, that you get out there, um, there was one main um, streaming service that started very profitable. What has happened is that now we have a lot more other companies that also have their own streaming service because they've seen how profitable it is there. So if your industry is very profitable, it's easy to get into. We're going to see that there's going to be a lot more competition that will be joining in. All right. Um, if the barriers to enter in the market are low, then it's easy for the new businesses to enter. Um, as, uh, as, I've, as I've said there. So the easier it is to get into a certain industry, the easier it's going to be um, uh, for, for competitors to, to come in and to, to compete with, uh, with you directly. Um, new competitors can quickly and easily enter the market, and if it takes a little time and money to, to enter the market, so that the easier it is to get into the market, the more likely you're going to have those competitors coming in there. Um, and if there are a few suppliers of a product or service, but many buyers, it may be easy to enter the market, right? So that's a, a situation where maybe the, the current businesses aren't satisfying the needs of their clients um, sufficiently. So that means that other businesses can come in in which they can potentially satisfy the, the demand for, for the product out there. All right, and then we're going to look at um, the, the power of our competitors and our competitive rivalry. So competitors selling the same or similar products or services may have a greater impact on the market of the business. All right, so this is our competition, uh, the business environment. Uh, it's not about hippies saying, uh, shawal, you know, we, uh, let's all share, part, uh, share a part of the pie here, right? Businesses are there to try and get customers away from their competitors. Right, so we see, right, how, how, how much competition is, is in this environment? If, if competitors have a unique product or service, then they will have greater power. So the more unique your product or service, the more power that you are going to have 
over, um, over that particular environment. Uh, a business with many competitors in the same market has very little power in their market. So if you look at um, uh, the, the fast food industry, right, there's a lot of competition there. So particular individual businesses, they don't have a lot of power because there's such a great variety of choice to choose from. So customers can go anywhere and they can go and find the, the best deals uh, which, which will suit them. However, that might not always suit the business. And then we've got to draw up a, a competitor's profile so that they can determine their own strengths as well as that of their competitors. So you need to see, right, what are our strengths? What are our competitors' strengths? How can we take advantage of our strengths to maybe exploit the weakness of our competitors and to pull um, more, um, more customers our way? And what are our competitors' strengths? Now, if I know what the strengths of my competitors are, I can come up with a strategy in which I can maybe um, boost up uh, uh, our weaknesses to make sure that our weaknesses are less and that our strengths are stronger. So you need to know who you are competing against and what their strengths are. All right, and then uh, some businesses have uh, the necessary resources to start price wars and continue selling at a loss until some or all competitors leave, leave, the, leave the market, right? So they can potentially go into a price war where they, they undercut each other um, the whole time and that, well, the people who benefit most from that are the, the consumers, um, but however, a price war is going to lead to a loss of resources. So the company that has that is able to um, uh, buffer from, from massive losses are the ones that are going to win. So it's, it's quite an aggressive uh, strategy, and you'll see that in certain markets, it's very, very competitive where there's continuous price wars because people are competing for those um, consumers. And we especially see that in uh, hard economic uh, downturns where uh, each business has to compete for, for every, um, com uh, every consumer that they can get. Um, and then we look at threats of substitutes, so we have to establish where the substitute products have improved their products or sell lower quality goods at lower prices. So can my product be substituted? Who can substitute it? If it's going to be substituted, is it going to be substituted by a product that's superior or inferior to us? And if the business's product can be easily be substituted, it weakens the power of the business in the market. So if I can just go to the shops and I buy um, a rival brand, it's easy as power for me, I can, uh, I can uh, get on with it then. And we're going to see that the business has got um, little power in, uh, in that regard. And if the business sells unique products, it will not be threatened by substitute products. So the more unique your product, right, the less likely it will be to be, uh, to be substituted. All right, Looney, I think we can have a break. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Guys, we are going to take a quick break. Before we do, don't forget to send us your questions and comments on our social media platforms, as well as take part in that competition so that you can stand yourself a chance to win data. Thank you so much, and we'll see you after this. Welcome back from the break, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Dave, thank you. Over to you. Uh, we're going to be uh, going through the last part of, of the essay question. This can also potentially be a section B question. Um, so please just make sure that uh, you pay attention and we'll finish off with a couple of multiple choice questions. So this question is um, uh, advise uh, the business on, on steps they should consider when uh, evaluating strategies. So steps in evaluating strategies, and, and these steps can be uh, in, in any order. Right, so but firstly, we examine the underlying basis of the business strategy. So what is it that, uh, that the business wants to achieve? So uh, once again, um, are we looking at um, increasing our sales? So therefore, we're going to go for an intensive strategy, or is the business uh, under a bit of hardship? So we're going to go for a defensive strategy. So it will determine what are we wanting to achieve with the business. Then we have to look forward and backwards uh, into the implementation process and compare the expected performance with the actual performance. So what is it that we want to achieve 
and what have we actually achieved. So if you think of it, uh, look at, uh, at, your, at your prelim marks. Did you achieve everything that you thought you would achieve? Right, so what were your goals and what did you actually achieve? Now, if they're exactly uh, on par there, then you know that, uh, that you're winning there. It's the same thing for the business. If, if the results are what they expected, then they know that their strategy is correct. If there's a big deviation in that, then they know that they're going to have to relook at that strategy and see what the problem is. Um, and then we're going to measure the business performance in order to determine the reasons for deviations and uh, analyze these reasons. So if we look, um, a lot of businesses will, will look at their, their poor performance in, in 2020, and they might say, right, what caused that? And you can say, right, it's because uh, the government uh, introduced the lockdown and we couldn't do business with uh, other foreign countries. Right? So that might explain why there's a big deviation. So you have to see, right, what is the reason for, for the deviation? Um, then we take corrective action so that the deviations may be, may be corrected. So you didn't get the marks that you wanted in your prelim exam, right? You, you're going to take corrective action, so you're going to say, right, now I'm going to study even harder. Instead of studying six hours a day, I'm going to be putting uh, eight to ten hours a day. And so you're taking that corrective action to ensure that you achieve the results that you want to achieve. And it's the same thing with the business. What do they have to do in order to ensure that they get the results that they want? And then we have to set specific dates for control and, and follow-up right, so that everyone knows, right, what is expected when, um, uh, how hard do we have to work, and how much time do we have uh, in which we can um, uh, correct our strategy. Um, we have to draw up a table of the advantages and disadvantages of the strategy. Right, so what's working for us, what, what isn't working for us, what happens if, uh, if we go down the defensive uh, path com compared to uh, integration strategies. So we've got to look at all the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of those particular strategies. Then we need to decide on the desired outcome. So what is it that we want? Right. Do we want to grow our sales? Yes, we want to make sure that, we, uh, that we're increasing our, our sales or the business is under a little bit of hardship. So in order to, to prevent the business from being liquidated, we might have to retrench some lines there. So you have to continuously look at right, where uh, is the business um, falling under and what is our desired outcome? Are we just looking to survive or are we looking to thrive? Um, and we have to consider the impact of the strategic implementation uh, in the internal and external environments of the business. So what is our impact going to be? All right. What is the impact going to be if we decide to close our business and move all of our manufacturing to China? Um, or is the South African public going to um, turn, uh, turn their backs uh, on us and say, right, you're not looking after South Africans anymore, therefore we're not going to, um, uh, we're not going to support you? So we have to see, right, um, what is the feeling of uh, our stakeholders? How are our stakeholders going to be impacted on that? And, and we have to take that into account when it comes to our strategy. All right, so now we're going to be uh, moving on to uh, some, some multiple choice questions that, uh, that will come out of uh, your, your paper one. We're just going to go through them uh, briefly, and I'm just going to help you to make sure that you don't make uh, any uh, silly mistakes that could potentially cost you some marks. So the first multiple choice question that we're going to go through is uh, Teddy's car manufacturers, they implemented a certain uh, integration strategy when they bought tail motor spares. So we've got our, our various options. Is it horizontal integration? Is it intensive? Is it forward? Or is it backward? So if we look at our answer, there are two potential answers here. It could either be forward or it could be backward. Um, remember forward is where we're looking to take over our distributors. So we're getting closer to um, our, 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 our end consumers. And backward is where we're looking to take over our suppliers. So for Teddy's car manufacturers, they, um, they might want to control the, the spares so as to make sure that um, the right quality spare parts 
are going into people's cars when they're servicing them and fixing them, which ensures quality of their car there. They could also perhaps um, go um, buy, buy them as a supplier to ensure that the parts that they're getting from the suppliers that they're putting into their car is of the correct quality um, to ensure that, um, that the business is supplying their customers with the correct goods. So it's a little bit of a tricky question. Let's make sure that um, you, you look for the best possible answer. Well, and yeah, there, were, there, were two, uh, there were two possible correct solutions. Our next question is ABC Paints operates in a certain sector and they specialize in the manufacturing of paints. Now, when you see the word manufacturing, that should immediately um, raise, um, um, ring a couple of bells there right, in terms of what sector are we dealing with. So if we look at our options, we've got the secondary sector, the primary sector, the tertiary sector, and then the economic sector. So if we look at our answer, the answer is the secondary sector. Remember that the uh, secondary sector has got to do with manufacturing. They're taking raw materials from either other secondary sector businesses or the primary sector businesses and they're converting those raw materials into semi-finished products or finished products in which they will um, pass on to the tertiary sector or sell uh, directly to, to, to their consumers. Right? Do not confuse business environments and the sectors of the economy. They are very, very different things and it's a, it's a, a, a common mistake that a lot of matriculants make. All right, and then uh, this act regulates the implementation of affirmative action when businesses appoint new workers. All right, so we've got, uh, we've got four options. The first one is the Consumer Protection Act. Uh, second option is the Employment Equity Act. The third option is a broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Act. And then finally, we've got the Labor Relations Act. Now, this can be uh, quite, a, quite a tricky question, um, and, and a lot of learners get very confused when it comes to the, di uh, the different acts and, and, what they, and what they stand for, um, especially when it comes to labor relations, employment equity, um, and broad-based black economic empowerment. There, there's certain sections there that uh, a lot of matriculants get confused with, so you need to make sure that you understand all the different acts, their purposes, and how they impact the business um, uh, completely so that you don't get, uh, get that confused. So if we look at, uh, at the answer, the answer is the Employment Equity Act. Okay, remember that's all about making sure there's equality in the workplace and that uh, the business is representative of the South African demographics um, of the country. So demographics is like um, what is the population um, made up of in terms of age, um, what is uh, the, the racial breakup of, of the population. And there's a provision in the Employment Equity Act where um, they will um, apply affirmative action so as um, to, to make sure that they can redress um, imbalances uh, from the past on previously disadvantaged individuals. Uh, so don't confuse it with the Labor Relations Act, which has to do with how how business, uh, the employer and employees uh, interact with, uh, with each other. Um, uh, Broad-based black economic empowerment is all about empowering previously disadvantaged individuals, but there's all those pillars that, uh, that can go with that. And the Consumer Protection Act is just about making sure that we're looking after our consumers and they're not getting taken ad advantage of. So, our final thoughts for, for, for pay for one. Firstly, make sure you get a good night's rest. Please aim for, for eight hours um, so that your brain is feeling, uh, is feeling refreshed. Um, you need sleep, it, it aids your recovery, and it's also going to make sure that uh, you're fresh for your paper and, and that, uh, that you've got all your, your neurons firing on all cylinders there. Um, read the instructions very, very carefully. Um, a lot of matriculants don't read the instructions. They answer all three questions from section B, um, and uh, the, the two, and they answer the two essay questions from section C. Um, you, you're going to be wasting a lot of time there, and the markers will only mark the first two questions from section B, and they'll only mark one question from section C. So you don't want to be uh, wasting your time 
and that comes into, uh, into my next part, is manage your time effectively. Uh, use that 10 minutes of reading time. Start with an essay. See which essay uh, tickles your fancy. Uh, so read through that, and then read through the rest of the paper. And uh, while you're reading through the rest of the paper, your, your subconscious will be working on, uh, on, your, on your essay question. And you can also start uh, your, your paper with your essay question. You don't have to um, prescribe to starting at a section A, B, or C. Start with whatever you feel most comfortable with and make sure you manage your time. Don't waste time on section A because that's going to cost you in, uh, in section B and section C. And go out and crush it, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've prepared uh, hard. Go through those, those past papers and, uh, and go out there and, and give it your all. Thank you so much, Dave. Guys, it's been an amazing show. I hope you enjoyed it. We are wishing you everything of the best for the upcoming exam. Prepare yourselves as much as you can and use all of the resources that we have available for you. Congratulations to all of our competition winners who will be announced on our Facebook page after the show. Don't forget to check out our schedule as well as extra study resources, guys, on www.wasometrics.co.za. From me, Looney, Nicolene and Dave, thank you and goodbye.